Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Joining me, Michael Scott in Oxford, UK, and uh, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, DC, to the 38th jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the for former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session in about 40 minutes time. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A button and not the chat button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try and put them to the panel to consider uh, when I come back on. We urge you to ask questions as and when they occur to you so that we don't get a bottleneck and that some people miss out at the end. Now, I'm looking forward to this uh, very important discussion today. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Mike Scott. We have two Mikes with us today, Mike Scott and Michael Sachs. Mike Sachs. Uh, I'm very happy to be continuing this series with my partner, Mike Scott, and to be returning to the issue of refugees, which we have discussed previously. And I'm sorry to say the problem appears to become ever more complicated and difficult in the meantime. Our panelists today include Barnabas Asprey, who is from the United Kingdom and currently an assistant professor at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, not far here from Washington. And he is particularly interested in the way that Christian belief and practice interact with contemporary Western society and its problems, including that of refugees. Catherine Donato is the Donald G. Herzberg Professor at Georgetown University and former director of the well-regarded Institute for the Study of International Migration in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, a very important institute, which is a source of great knowledge on this subject. Rachel Cronick, coming to us from Montreal, is a clinician scientist based at the Sherpa and Lady Davis Research Institutes there, and she is affiliated with McGill University, particularly interested in immigration policy and its consequences for children and families. And Mike Sachs, Emeritus Professor at the University of Suffolk in the UK, currently chairs the United Nations Endorsed Institute for responsible leadership and has made a big point of being concerned about the educational opportunities and conditions for refugees and of course, particularly the children amongst them. I'd like to go to Catherine first uh, to give us a little bit of a historical perspective on just how severe the situation is today and, uh, and how it got just as bad as it has. Catherine, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you to everyone who is attending. Um, the situation, I don't know if I could cover this in five minutes, but I will do my best to, to, to lay out uh, uh, co the context, the contemporary context. Um, uh, in terms of the last uh, uh, century, century and a half, we've never been at a uh, record high, as high the, as the numbers are currently of refugees and asylum seekers, people who are on the move and searching for protection. Uh, and those numbers are at record highs, more than uh, 110 million are, is the number count, you know, counted and published by uh, the UN Agency for Refugees, UNHCR. Um, but what we know is that there are often more people 
um, uh, and that those numbers are typically underestimates. Just to give you some highlights of what right now the situation is around the world in different regions, we have more than 6 million uh, people displaced, some of them internationally, some of them internally, uh, as a result of the conflict that began in April 2023 in Sudan. We have more than 7 million Venezuelans uh, who have left Venezuela, many of them is living in, in countries in South America, but as, as we know, many are making them their, um, are, go, are heading northward, uh, attempting to come into the U.S. Um, we have more than uh, 7 million um, Ukrainians who are living in the EU, or her, and another more than 3 million Ukrainians who have been internally displaced as a result of uh, of that war. Um, we have, you know, a variety of other, you know, obviously we have millions, um, uh, estimates suggest about 2 million um, Palestinians who have been displaced as a result of the Israeli war. I mean, those are the biggest numbers, but then we still have, you know, 700, 800,000 Rohingya living in um, Bangladesh having left most of them in, in the summer uh, of 2017. And, um, you know, we have certainly smaller, but still very large groups of people who have been displaced around the world. Um, those people, individuals, as well as their families are suffering huge hardships and estimates suggest that these numbers have never been, haven't been as high uh, is, post-World War II compared to what they were immediately after World War II. So we are in record um, territory here. Uh, and, um, and we seem to, at least in the last uh, decade to two decades, been in a situation where more and more people are experiencing, at minimum, generalized violence and conditions related to violence that threaten them um, some of them are individually persecuted and would meet the, the internal, the international uh, legal standard for refugee, but many others uh, may not technically meet that legal standard, uh, but nonetheless are searching for the same kind of protection. Um, so we're at uh, historically high rates and a lot of diversity around the world with regional diversity in terms of areas experiencing large scale displacement. Um, the situation couldn't be more dire for, for as many people as, as uh, uh, you know, as we're looking at now. Mike Sachs, thank you, Catherine, very much. Uh, that's a pretty bleak, picture that that uh, Catherine draws and uh, your involvement with the United Nations uh, I presume gives you some insight into how international organizations are dealing with this and what the strands of hope might be that would be out there to educate people to give them a decent life uh, to return them to some kind of uh, dignity and respect and humanity, uh, despite their situation. Please remember to unmute yourself. You're, you're on mute, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I don't represent the UN directly. Yeah, I do obviously head up one of its uh, one of its organizations in terms of the Institute for Responsible Leadership. And I think the UN has increasingly um, taken a responsible leadership stance on this, and particularly um, the organization that Catherine refers to, the UN um, HCR, which is the High Commission for Refugees, which is otherwise known as the Refugee Agency of the UN, which is um, based in, in uh, Geneva, which is one of the biggest, um, the biggest of the organizations that exists under the UN auspices. And this organization does take um, a lot of care um, holistically for um, dealing with the plight of refugees in terms of coordination um, and also in terms of delivery. And um, as we've seen um, in Gaza, for, for instance, this may sometimes be frustrated by particular political policies, 
which prevent access to uh, to specific areas. But nonetheless, the intention is there. And I would say that from recent observations, the Secretary General of the UN, um, Antonio Guterres, has actually said some very positive things about the need to not only support, but show solidarity with refugees, particularly in the light of some of the dire circumstances that Catherine has begun to uh, to sketch out. This is, this applies, you know, to everything from from health um, right through to uh, to issues about um, you know uh, children um, and their particular problems with 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 education. And I would just say uh, something which is a bit of a touchstone for me in terms of the Institute for Responsible Leadership. Um, a lot of this is, can be traced back to the Sustainable Development Goals, which, um, which exist, the 17 uh, goals, which uh, relate to the need for equality, for peace, you know, for um, providing equality of education, for, for providing... Um, you know, high quality uh, services across the whole world um, in terms of moving forward. These are quite idealistic at one level, but they do act as a kind of driver to take us forward. And so that will be my opening comment from the viewpoint of the UN. I think the UN is generally a force for the good, but that doesn't mean to say that everything it wants to do actually can occur because of um, maybe the interests of certain countries and so on, and the way in which these can lead to um, some uh, cross swords, as it were, and uh, some vacillation in terms of dealing with what is currently a major crisis situation. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Rachel, your particular concern and, and the intersection with this issue has to do with, I think, the uh, emotional and psychological impacts of being in refugee status and Particularly for, particularly for families and children. And with such numbers, such overwhelming numbers now, uh, what, what do you see as the prospects for improvement? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, indeed, as, as, as Catherine pointed out, the numbers are at an all-time high. And we have to keep in mind that numbers are, there's no prediction that numbers will decrease. And if anything, due to the climate crisis, we we are likely to see um, unimaginable, unprecedented numbers of forcibly displaced people, whether due to climate crisis or ongoing conflict. So in that sense, um, the picture is bleak. But when we actually look from the perspective of um, of mental health and people's capacity for integration, resilience, and recovery, there is a great deal to be optimistic about. Because what we know is that despite people's exposure to horrific trauma, that the majority of, of forcibly displaced people, particularly refugees who are granted protection, do very well that it is a small minority who carry a significant burden of mental health problem, despite everything they've been exposed to. But what we're learning as mental health research um, makes advances is that what they experience in the host country, the country they land in, whether it be the United Kingdom or Canada or, or the United States, um, what happens to them there is a very significant determinant of their mental health and trajectory for integration. So when we, um, I would use the word vulnerabilize, when, when host nations vulnerabilize children and their parents, for example, by keeping them in limbo, um, not granting them uh, security that they can count on for, for, for a long period of time, this we can see increases mental health burden. And then of course, with mental health burden, comes all the difficulties of integration, um, with which come with all the economic difficulties. So in other words, I'm saying when we, when we have hospitable, welcoming reception practices, the so-called crisis of refugee arrivals can really be mitigated. People in fact integrate, find jobs, et cetera. 
Um, at, but unfortunately, we we tend to discursively frame refugees and asylum seekers and forcibly displaced people as the crisis themselves and and potential burdens on our economies and school systems, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we need to work on a reframing. Um, the, I'm not I'm not uh, an economist, but the economic mm. studies I, I know that have been done have actually actually shown refugees and asylum seekers are you know tend to contribute <laughs> more than they take um, in any host society context. So yes, we we need to be attentive to the alarming numbers, but we also have to keep in mind um, that this need not be a crisis if we respond in the appropriate ways, because people can do very well. Thank you for that. I think uh, nice to have some optimism lurking uh, mm -hmm. in the shadows. Uh, Barney, uh, your focus is on religious issues, and I wonder if you can speak for a moment about how the uh, developed world has allowed has allowed this to happen. What what are the what are the morals and the and the mm -hmm. ethics of this situation, mm -hmm. and, and whom can we count upon to to respond to it? Well, I mean, I think uh, anybody who ignores the role that religion plays in this whole crisis is never going to really understand it, or they might misunderstand it, because religion is very much at the root of a lot of what goes on with regard to. Uh, policies about who is accepted, who is let in, and especially who integrates well into uh, a new developing or de a new developed nation. I mean, um, but that said, uh, we shouldn't just accept up front that when people give religious motivations for the, for particular uh, action with regard to welcoming or not welcoming refugees that those are genuinely religious or that they are rooted in an authentic version of that religion because a lot of the time economic motivations or other kinds of um, uh, responses can be masked by religious motivations so i think we need to be careful when we're analyzing the the way people portray their motivations for their attitudes towards refugees i think from the perspective of all three of the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, there's overwhelming support in those traditions for the welcome of strangers, especially strangers who are forcibly displaced. Uh, that's characterized in various different ways. But all those traditions are complex. And if people mine those religions for uh, resources to restrict immigration, they are going to find uh, pieces of evidence here and there to justify that kind of response as well. Thanks, Barney. Uh, I, I I want to turn to some of the political things that are that are raging around the world right now, and especially how this has been cast more as a political problem than than any other respect. And Catherine, you, you might want to refer to the circumstances on the southern border of the United States, where, of course, there's there is a huge influx at the moment, as I understand it. Uh, yeah. This is something I've looked at in the past and been at the border and, and observed, but it sounds like all previous activity on the border has been rendered minor by what's going on now. Yeah, certainly the, um, the numbers at the southern border um, are extremely high right now. And, and, um, never been higher so we have to um that, that that is certainly helping to fuel um uh the polit the politics around the upcoming election and the politics uh locally in the state of texas and how the the what the governor is doing there and what the governor uh how the governor has influenced uh, places like Washington, D.C. and New York City and Philadelphia and Chicago and Denver with respect to sending people from the border up uh, to those cities. So um, I, I can say, I mean, I totally agree that there is something extremely positive uh, about um, uh, refugees in host countries that tends to be masked by 
uh, the politics um, uh, currently in the U.S. certainly, but around the world, the politics that are created around this issue. Um, and um, but then what doesn't help is that numbers uh, are at a record high at the southern U.S. border, and most of the people coming in are, um, you know, claiming they need protection. So they're not coming in. Uh, saying only that they're seeking a better economic, you know, set of opportunities, but they're seeking protection. And that is leading to um, conversations about how to restrict asylum uh, in the U.S., how to change asylum. I don't think they'll be able to change asylum law because that means Congress has to be involved and Congress is very politicized on one side or the other on the issue. But um, I think it's pressuring the Biden administration to uh, change some rules that um, that uh, that would mean that th there would be some restrictions in terms of how asylum is claimed and how quickly asylum claims are are um, vetted. Um, currently in the U.S., if you come in, um, if you fly in and you have a tourist visa and you don't want to return because you fear persecution, you can apply for affirmative asylum. Uh, and the rates are much higher with affirmative asylum, the rates of receiving it. Then if you come in through a border, like on, on foot, uh, the southern border, uh, there you have to go through a defensive asylum process and that can take years and up until very recently the biden administration was uh releasing most people into the u.s who were saying that that they feared um return because due to persecution and uh that would allow people to be in the u.s for a number of years as their claim to legal relief gets vetted um uh but again all all of this now has become so much more political, um, not only in the U.S., but around the world, such that um, uh, in the leading up to the, um, the primary uh, election yesterday in the state of New Hampshire, I, I read that people in New Hampshire's biggest concern, largest concern, right now is immigration, a state that doesn't receive many immigrants, doesn't host many immigrants, um, whether they're refugees or migrants of some other, uh, you know, who came in in another way. Um, and that really, compared to 20 years ago, when, when migration issues, refugee issues were um, usually ranked five, six, or seven across the nation as being the most important issue, uh, this really concerns me. So, um, the governor of Texas has, um, there, there was just a few days ago, um, a litigation about, uh, removing barbed wire, um, on top of, um, uh, areas, fences and areas of demarcation at the border. Um, the Biden administration argued that they wanted that barbed wire removed. The state of Texas argued against it. And there was a court that sided on the on the side of the federal government in this issue, um, but this will be relitigated now at a higher court level. This, the 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 uh, current governor of Texas has done many things, um, uh, not only sending people from the border up to cities um, that are tend to be blue cities, but the, he's done other things in terms of putting. Uh, um, demarcating in the middle of the Rio Grande, the river that separates much of the Texas border uh, with Mexico. Um, he put this demarcation in the middle, uh, which has, uh, which is quite dangerous as people try to cross and there've been more deaths as a result. So again, I don't think that, that at least in this hemisphere, uh, you could get a more politicized moment for refugees which really complicates not only their ability, you know, uh, to do well in a host country, but complicates all of what came, what all of the processes that other people who are not already in host countries, right, are, experiences, are experiencing as they try to become resettled uh, in a host country. So there's a lot of challenges here. Um, 
What you say about New Hampshire, Catherine, moves mm -hmm. me to note that, and I would welcome everybody's comments on this briefly, um, many of those people complaining by their very surnames, one knows come from families who were immigrants to the United States. By their surnames, their history, their uh, what we know about the evolution of these issues here. And many people seem to resent immigrants, for example, for seeking better economic circumstances. I can say for one quite openly that I would not exist as an American were it not for my parents coming here, in my father's case alone, in my mother's case with her family, to better their economic circumstances. And a, a very natural thing that we promote in other, in other ways and say, come here and you'll be middle class and you'll succeed and you'll move up the ladder. So there is a vast um, puzzlement there, some would say hypocrisy about people from immigrant families. And I suspect that might be the case in quite a few other countries too, perhaps including Canada, I don't know. So I don't know who wants to hold, take hold of that particular part of the issue. Mike, maybe, maybe you do. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> I think what I would do, because I don't want to tread on any um, sensitive North American toes, as it were, on this, because obviously there's a lot more that's been running in the in the press and media about this uh, situation in Texas. But it does strike me that there are distinct parallels, uh, if not quite the same, with the UK, with this obsession with boat people uh, coming over. Um, and particularly people, you know, being trafficked on lorries and other things to get into the into the UK. And this has been a really headline issue in the in the UK. And I would like to say a few words about it, if I may, because Please do. it is it is fascinating because this this policy, uh, which uh, has been introduced by the or has been attempted to be introduced by the uh, Conservative government since 2022 under the um, rather controversial leadership of uh, Boris Johnson of shipping uh, boat people, um, asylum seekers and so on over to Rwanda um, has been exceptionally controversial because the idea is not so much to numerically ship lots of people over, but it has been to act as a deterrent to people taking uh, risky ways, um, risky pathways into, into the country. And, um, you know, to sort of ship them off instead. But of course, as you will all probably know, um, this uh, policy was um, essentially overturned as being lawful by the Court of Appeal, firstly, in the UK. And then it was overturned again, sort of positively overturned from my viewpoint um, uh, by the um, Supreme Court, which has said, well, look, you can't do this because... Um, there are in inadequacies in Rwanda in terms of the treatment of refugees, in terms of human um, rights and so on. Um, there, are, there are defects in the asylum protocols that Rwanda offers um, in terms of legal representation, in terms of issues about discrimination against certain minorities like Afghans and, 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 and Syrians. And that also that there was a policy in Rwanda of shipping people back to where they come from into very perilous conditions. And so this has proved very, very uh, controversial. And I, I, I'm, I'm quite animated about this because even in the press today, <laughs> we have um, a situation where Rishi Sunak, um, despite um, the Lords wanting, uh, you know, we have two chambers, obviously one is the Commons, one's the Lords, and the Lords saying, look, they're not happy about approving what was agreed by Parliament, this bill which would enable the Rwanda situation. Um, we're not happy until we're convinced that Rwanda will be able to process refugees appropriately and in a non-discriminatory way. But still, today, the headlines in the paper, in the Times, you know, well, um, Rishi Sunak's pushing on regardless and is determined to have this in place in the spring. I think this is highly unlikely because of a variety of things. Um, the, the issue, you know, to do with uh, legal resistance, the question which is on even con senior conservative minds, is it really a deterrent anyway, if that's the pathway you want to go, 
because there's no sign that it makes much difference to the volume of, of boat people coming in, taking that kind of uh, parameter. And also, it seems to be incredibly poor, bringing the economics in, poor value for money, because already 240 million has been spent on this scheme going to Rwanda. And uh, with, with you know, 50 million stashes of money to, destined to follow. And so it really is a pretty, it's not unprecedented. There are some examples of this occurring in other societies like Israel to Rwanda, for example. But none of these have proved particularly successful. But I think the main obstacle will be that um, just as you have the tensions between the Republicans and Democrats in the US, we have tensions about an election coming up in this particular year. Rishi Sunak is not the most popular person in the world, and most of the predictions are on a Labour victory. So much of this is going to be overturned anyway. So what we're having really, and, and this is where I'm going to end, is a situation where, as Catherine is saying, that the refugees are being dealt with as a political football. You know, it's a kind of political, um, you know, sort of uh, position for Rishi Sunak. He wants to get re-elected. He knows that some people are exercised about this particular issue. I think wrongfully so. Um, I totally agree with Rachel on that in terms of the benefit the refugees can be can bring, but. Um, you know they're they're actually being being dealt with in this kind of political mayhem, which is which is occurring in the UK, as it would seem in, in in the US. And what we need to do is to get back to the humanitarian and economic issues. And this is where it where it really cuts to the chase that it's in uh, many people's interests that uh, not that people put their lives at risk, that we create safe passageways to go from one country to another. And we recognize the skills that people can bring or otherwise, you know, to the economy and the jobs they can fill. And uh, we take a positive rather than a negative view of uh, what refugees who risk their lives coming over on small boats and being stuck in the backs of lorries. You know, um, we, we, we need to we need to look at this in a different kind of lens. Uh, good point, Mike. And I would ask Rachel and Barney. Uh, both to take up this issue of who speaks credibly for the refugees, who has the who has the standing in these very complex politicized moments to take the side of the refugees and the immigrants and uh, and not be a political pariah for doing so. Rachel. Yes, I can speak to that, and maybe I'll come back to the earlier question as sure. well. This is a, is also a fascinating one. I mean, I, I would say, as someone who does uh, research and uh, clinical work in the field with asylum seekers and refugees um, and people without status, that it is it is these migrants themselves who are best positioned to speak for themselves and that it's actually their voices that need to be amplified. Now, that's actually not easy. So I don't want to be overly utopian because um, folks are, 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 are precarious and sticking their necks out politically is certainly not easy when they already feel um, in a position of, of threat. Um, but I think actually we need to elevate and amplify the stories of of people themselves, um, and so off, and that that needs to be our roles as as researchers and advocates and and um, even political commentators, so that their actual narratives are heard. I do would, if you don't mind, like I would like to return to the point of the highly polarized discourse around sure. refugees. Because I actually think this, I mean, it's a fascinating area of, of sort of sociological and psychological study. How do our collective attitudes towards forcibly displaced people change and shift? And so firstly, I would say there, uh, Didier Fassin in, in France has a very interesting account um, over the decades, how um, countries, nations' attitudes shift towards uh, refugees according to labor needs in countries mm -hmm. and that we have a much more receptive perspective and a hospitable perspective when, when there are higher labor needs and there's less scarcity. 
I think in across, uh, perhaps it's not an exaggeration to say across the world, we can say at least in Canada and the United States, we're at this, this moment of um, dangerously heightened polarization where um, citizens in our two countries, at least, um, are very frightened. Are, are are frightened by scarcity, are frightened by their grocery store bills, are frightened by the lack of housing. And I think this kind of fear, um, we 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 when when we're in panic, we we want to find a perpetrator. And so scapegoating becomes a psychological mechanism that can and can help us feel like we're in some kind of control. And so of course, who is being scapegoated? refugees and displaced people at the border. Um, I think we need to have as a response, um, not just um, not just bombarding people with a message of, of needing to open their arms to refugees, but we do need, which I do think we need, but I think we need to actually make people feel heard and seen and and respond to people's needs and and help help people understand it's not a zero sum game. We don't have to take care of migrants versus taking care of citizens. Um that we're part of a global community and that ethics and morals have have no borders. Um so in other words empathy becomes uh dependent on privilege. And so we need to help folks who are feeling precarious and scared feel more secure. Well put, Barney. I completely agree with Rachel. I mean, I think fear is part of what drives this whole discussion at the moment. It's a it's a very powerful political tool that governments can use to get themselves reelected, and they want to scapegoat somebody who can't vote. So the migrants and the refugees are the obvious choice of a scapegoat. But I also completely agree with Mike that that doesn't actually make economic sense. If you talk to any um, economists who really know their stuff, they know that immigration is always good for the economy in the long run. It may, you know, in the first couple of years cause a deficit, but in the long run, it's always good for the economy. But that message hasn't really gotten through to the voting public because of this huge amount of fear which uh, is being capitalized on by the governments in the place. And I think um, I think Rachel's also right that the way to combat that kind of fear and that kind of resistance is um, the people who are opposed to welcoming refugees, uh, they don't have a human face to, 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 to put to this problem. They just think there's this mass immigration problem. There's all these people over there who we need to keep out of our country or else our country is going to go to pot. But the moment you give them an individual human being with a face and with a story, the attitude changes. And so one of the ways that we can perhaps persuade the voting public, um, you know, statistics don't seem to be that persuasive because statistics don't get at the heart of the uh, emotional motivations that are driving certain policies. Uh, I mean, we should certainly use the statistics for sure, but the human stories, the human faces, are a way to sort of break past some of that initial emotional resistance. If I could just add, um, uh, I I totally agree, and I think that the both uh, the UN Agency for Refugees and now the UN Agency since twenty twenty six six since twenty sixteen the UN Agency for Migrants have been spending um, to get the word out right to get the individual faces to do the kind of marketing around here are the people right and here are their experiences to get more of that narrative out still much more needs to be done I I agree but um when I was at a meeting in 2017 with various uh, uh people from both of the UN agencies where they're saying you know we really don't do enough of that I realized, well, yeah, you know, we we certainly don't. So I, I think I see them moving in that direction. Um, I do want to say one thing. There is this political divide, and it's clear in all of our comments. There is um, uh, something that has happened as a result of, you know, uh, countries, governments, politicians casting refugees as good or evil, 
uh, mostly evil in some way, right? Some way of um, uh, saying they're bad, despite the evidence, um, is that in most of the countries where the, the uh, refugees be have become so politicized, um, these countries have gone to temporary humanitarian visas of some sort um, to accommodate, right, the fact that there is um, uh, not only many people who who need protection, uh, but there is a humanitarian um, uh, emergency here that we we have to respond to as as a country, as a nation. So mm. the way the U.S. has been doing it for the last. Mm number of years is um, allowing people, you know, doing what they call a credible fear interview at the border. And then, you know, that's not a, um, it's not a merit base. It's not an analyzing your merits for asylum, but it's, you know, if people say they're afraid, they let them stay in the U.S. And then they have how many years until, um, until their legal uh, relief claim is adjudicated. That's one way to be humanitarian. Another way, formally, the U.S. now has a parole program with four countries, people from Cuba, from Venezuela, from Nicaragua, and Haiti, who uh, they're trying to, this parole program says, if you have a sponsor in the U.S., you could come in to the U.S. with parole uh, for two years. You can get, get a work um, permit immediately. Um, you do not come up through the border. You fly into the U.S. So that sort of helps, um, you know, minimize the humanitarian concerns that many of us have as people try to make their way on foot, right, um, up to the U.S. Um, uh, and throughout the world, right, in, in Colombia in 2021, the president at that time announced a, a humanitarian visa, 10-year humanitarian visa for Venezuelans at the time, the Duque administration thought there would be 1.5 million uh, Venezuelans who would receive that and close to 2.5 Venezuelans were eligible and received the humanitarian visa, permitting them to stay in the country for 10 years to work, to have their kids go to school. Um, and throughout the world, we see the emergence since um, the, uh, uh, since really the civil, um, uh, unrest in Syria and the large scale movement of Syrians and Afghans uh, to Europe, we see more countries developing out these temporary humanitarian visas. Whether they're good or not, I mean, they're good in the short run for individual lives, right? But over the long run, it's basically kicking the football down the, you know, uh, down the, the, uh, the path, so to speak. Um, because what happens when you get to the end of that temporary period? Right. Um, so, and and so it doesn't give people uh, a permanent claim to being in their host country by no means, and and that has implications for their lives, for their children's lives. Um, but there is a response, so I just want to make sure it's not as if countries are not responding in some way, but they're recognizing there's this huge uh, political divide and they're saying, okay, well, we can do this to, and it's not a, it's not a substitution by no means right. for what should be done. Right. Thank you. Um, Rachel, I'm going to ask you for a quick comment that you want to make, and then we need to go back to um, Mike Scott because we have a, I think an almost unprecedented number of questions that I see coming in. <laughs> On the, on the Q&A, we want to try to do that. And we really only have about another half an hour to go. So, Rachel, uh, the comment that you were inspired to make by what Catherine just said. There are two things I want to say, but, but I'm not sure if I can be quick enough. So let me start with the first one. Um, and then you let you, you can sure. let me know. So in terms of these temporary visas, I, I, I mean, I agree with Catherine that these are really important um, um mechanisms to try and protect people in these polarized times. At the same time, I just want to share with you some of the mental health research 
on only having temporary protection. There have been a number of studies done in Australia, and we recently wrote a meta-analysis, which is in peer review, comparing mental health status across visa statuses. Mm. And what seems to be very clear is that not having a full promise of protection, having temporary protection, especially when it comes with limited rights, for example, the right to reunite with family members who are in danger in a country of origin, that that this temp that this precariousness really is the driver of mental health problems in the population. So people have much higher rates of 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 mental disorders when they are rendered precarious and there are a number of reasons for this i mean we know in in the treatment of trauma the first phase of treatment is security so when people know ah i i'm safe temporarily but i could be deported to death or torture or war in two years this perpetuates um, PTSD and depression and anxiety in very, very serious ways. So, yes, I think we need to look at these alternative models, but they also some of them have a shadow side, depending on what on how precarious people are and, and the threat for future insecurity. The other thing I will say, and we can save it for later, is I wanted to speak a little bit about um, Canada's uh, shuttering of yes. borders. Um, and what the courts have said in terms of uh, U.S. representing a safe third country. But perhaps we'll come back to that via the questions. Okay, over to you, Mike. You have quite a few questions there. Yes, I have. And I, I apologize to people that uh, I might not be able to ask all the questions that have come in. I want to start with uh, with one uh, from Opal Malai. Um, and it, it talks about a country that you haven't mentioned so far. Uh, Opal says, I come from Thailand, and recently there have been a lot of pushback from Thai's government on Myanmar refugees, which is putting their lives at risk in Myanmar. As someone who wants to concentrate on the, con on the creation of refugees policy, what can you suggest the Thai government should do in order to protect those refugees but also a policy that would not harm Thailand and its image in dealing with the refugees. Perhaps, Catherine, you might like to start with that one. <clears throat> so um, there's a um, decades long um, uh, population of um, persons from Myanmar living in, in camps in Thailand. Uh, in this moment of millions of people, this group, this reality gets shorter shrift because it's maybe about 100,000 um, people from Myanmar who have been living in these camps in Thailand. And then, you know, with the the newer, let's say in the last 10 years, you know, the, um, the newer movements of uh, Rohingya and people from Myanmar, um, moving into Bangladesh, trying to get to Malaysia. Um, often, you know, very, very recently, it's people on boats from uh, from Bangladesh who have left Bangladesh and are trying to get into uh, Indonesia. Um, so this is um, a problem that isn't an issue that isn't going away, certainly. And uh, it's just at a lower um, scale. And so it's it's not, um, I mean, most of us know about the situation, most of us in this space. Uh, but I think that, you know, the UN has limited resources and they are, they are um, you know, the secretary general is, is always speaking about displacement, but often emphasizes the biggest um, displacements and the, the demands that, you know, what needs to be, um, how countries need to accommodate. Uh, those displacements. Uh, so I don't know exactly what can happen. I, I don't know the Thai case that well, um, but I will say that there every year there are additional people leaving Myanmar trying to get into to Thailand 
and uh, sometimes the border is open, sometimes it's closed. Um, uh, but but the issue is growing there. The issue of displacement of how Thailand um, becomes a host country. Does it become a host country? I mean, currently, like I said, there are about a hundred thousand people living in camps. If you're living, if you're a refugee living in camps in a host country, often that means the host country is not fully hosting you and restricting your ability to, to um, live only in those places and then restricting your ability to work. Um, most refugees who live in camps around the world typically are not permitted by the country in which they're living to work. Uh, and the kids are not permitted to go to schools outside of the camp. So th this is a growing issue. Uh, and uh, Human Rights Watch did a recent report on the issue um, in Thailand. So I urge you to, to uh, consult that report as well. Thanks, Catherine. I think if uh, this program has done anything, uh, it's to raise the, the min minority issue as well of a, uh, of a that we can forget, and uh, and I'm very very happy uh, that at Opel that you've you've actually raised that uh, for us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to go on to some of the economic issues now. Josh Chandler says, increasing the population of working people in an economy can grow the economy. What steps should governments take to ensure that immigrants and refugees are able to contribute to the economy? without risking the jobs of native workers. Can I just go on and say that Angela Pre Preston also raises this issue. She says, in research by Cato, they list research which cites three to 4% decrease in wages for workers because of immigrants in the United States. While migrants may not intend to cause a crisis, lower wage workers see it as a crisis because of lost wages. How do you find a middle road? Those are the two questions that are coming coming through. I see Mike is uh, is nodding. So Mike, do you want to try the first one and then? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, I do think that it goes back to a point that was raised earlier, that a lot of the questions about the political response to particular uh, patterns of migration or dealing with refugees in terms of pushback relates to the economic climate of the country concerned. And I think here we need to note that over 70% of refugees are actually going to low to middle income countries, which don't have a lot of resources anyway. And this obviously is quite an issue. And this is why the UN's position is, is quite important and the position of other governments in providing aid and supporting these countries is also, is also significant. So we need to look at the kind of climate that these groups are going into. But one of the things that I find really extraordinary in the UK case, if I can speak, with, speak on that as an example, is that we have many jobs in this country, including seasonal work, for example, which we should be welcoming uh, refugees with open arms, I mean, even without skills, because um, there are lots of roles to fill. And I think the governments have tended to be a bit anal about um, the issue of skills and the skills coming in, because they're looking, you know, oh, these are shortages that we have in expertise, and therefore we might take a different view to people who are coming in, let's say in the UK in terms of doctors, as opposed to other kinds of groups. But I think this um, is quite extraordinary, perhaps, in some of the more developed uh, developed communities, the developed countries. So we need to sort of keep up the keep up the pressure, as it were, uh, you know, in terms of looking at the dynamics for particular countries and particular governments. And it's also about the leadership that those governments um, those governments provide. Rachel, do you want to say anything about this? Well, well, this is, I mean, this is, a, this is at the heart of the com of this complex polarized issue. Um, people's, people's feeling that if, if uh, refugees are deserving of a place, then it will come at the cost 
of citizen security um, and citizens' wages. I mean, I would want to look very closely at that Cato study um, and 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 understand it because that's not in line with research that I've read. So I I, I would want to have a real critical appraisal of that particular study. And and if 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 wages are being brought down by the presence of newcomers. Well, maybe we have a problem with our wages system. <laughs> maybe we need an increase in the minimum wage across the board. Um, so I, I think these are these are complex issues, but they the questions really do get at the heart of people's fears about what it will mean to welcome the unknown other. Yeah, and I will I will add that there was a National Academy of Science study done published in 2016. It is. Uh, about the economic integration of migrants and refugees in the United States. It is free. Um, it is very long. And every economist who works at least slightly on the on this issue um, uh, was part of this report. The overwhelming uh, takeaway is that refugees and migrants add um, um, and that for refugees, it does take more time. It takes them typically uh, on average between five and 10 years, but then it's a net benefit uh, because, you know, when refugees come into the U.S., they do receive some subsidies, limited subsidies, as I'm sure my friends in Canada and the U.K. will tell us, would, could, could tell us. But um, nonetheless, it takes some time, but then the, it's a net positive um uh benefit. So I agree. I'm not sure what Cato is is referring to there. Um, but I, I highly I strongly urge anyone who's got interest in this in this question about how um refugees and migrants and labor markets affect the wages of natives, um, that they look at the National Academy of, of Sciences study. Um, and um you know, it's it sounds like such an easy question to answer, but in reality, if you're uh, if you're one of the social scientists trying to answer it, it, it isn't straightforward, and you'll see that in that report. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. So I'm going to go on to a question by Philip Sanderman, uh, and perhaps Barney, you might like to take this one first. Um, he says that. Uh, is a is a master's uh, master's uh, student at uh, at Georgetown. My question: How important is the financial moral support for people in countries who are willing to host or take care of refugees? The, the hearts of so many people are big, but their financial possibilities are limited. Uh, in in all these kind of debates, the kind of moral kind of question is hovering about. Uh, but for politics, what is what is the moral moral scene? Barney. So, so how important is the is the moral and financial consideration? Is that is that the question? Yeah. How important is the financial moral support for people? in countries who are willing to host or take care of ref refugees. Oh, I see, because of limited, because of limited finance, uh, even from yeah. people who are willing. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of it comes down to your conception of um, our moral responsibilities to those who are different from us, right? Uh, do, do we have a responsibility to embrace and welcome people from all over the world who look different to us, speak different languages. And it comes down to your conception of what humanity is. Is humanity just a, a bunch of individuals whose primary responsibility is just for their family? Or is our responsibility wider than that? Is humanity actually a common, uh, we say a common brother and sisterhood, or just a we're all in this together kind of attitude. And I think from a from a religious point of view, there's there's a lot of support for the idea that we're all in this together. We're all a common humanity. We're all brothers and sisters together, and we all stand or fall together. And so we should all support one another. And as people have already said here, it's not a zero sum game. It's not. It's not a. 
people often have a false economic model behind this, that if I give money to some refugee, that's less money than I have for myself. There's a limited amount of resources. And so if somebody else gets it, I have less. Whereas, of course, advanced, well, real economics knows that that's not how any of these things work, that there's it's possible to generate more resources, to generate more productivity, and it's possible to find solutions where everybody benefits instead of some people benefiting at the expense of others. And so I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I would be convinced that we should place an emphasis on the financial limitations of those who give support and help, because very often those limitations are more imagined than real, uh, and creative solutions can often be found that just increase the benefit for everybody. Isn't this to do with responsible leadership, Mike? Well, definitely, actually. And I think, um, you know, one can talk about, you know, the refugee situation in a way that all refugees form a sort of homo homogeneous group. But in fact, there are differentials and these different differentials are quite revealing. I mean, if we take the issue about the Ukrainian refugees, which we haven't said a lot about so far, and uh, as uh, Catherine was saying, there are one of the very largest groups at the moment and obviously politically very, uh, very significant. Um, the situation is that uh, Ukrainians have been given a lot of protection, albeit temporary, and uh, with all the significant consequences for their mental health and so on. But nonetheless, they've been given significant protection in the European Union, which unfortunately UK is no longer part of. Um, but they've been given a lot of protection in terms of accommodation, medical care, employment, education. And then I look at the treatment of some of some other refugees who are not white and predominantly Christian, but, you know, and and it seems, you know, like we almost have the equivalent of institutional racism, you know, in terms of the way in which these are regarded. And I think these differentials are quite important because they do reveal something about the kind of texture of society, but it's not just fear. But there is an undercurrent of discrimination in relation to different refugee groups. And I think this really needs to be plugged in, you know, wired in to some of the analysis. Um, so it's not just the econo economics of the situation. It's not just humanitarianism, but there is um, a question of moral judgments which are formed on the basis of really quite uh, flaky um, preoccupations to do with um, who is better, which group is better than another, you know, and this is not to take anything away from the plight of Ukrainian refugees, which has been extreme with, you know, millions of people going across the border to Poland and so on. But it's something that I would very much like to inject into the conversation. Yeah, if I could just just add that, you know, um, uh, Structural uh, racism or discrimination may be part of it, but it's also what's part of it is that some nations, given where they are located geographically, given political relationships with other nations, right? Um, ten, then there's a war, so their people would benefit. So there's some kind of historical political structure mm -hmm that facilitates, for example, the Ukrainians, um, UNHCR is certainly on the ground in Poland counting the numbers of Ukrainians coming in. and uh, But there are many Ukrainians who come in and don't stay under the auspices of UNHCR because as EU residents, they're able to go to Ireland. And Ireland, they may not even think about where Ireland is, but they show up in Ireland and, and you get processed immediately in the airport. It takes three yeah, yeah. hours. When you leave the airport, if you're Ukrainian, you have temporary work permit and you have a place to go. Um, and that, you know, that's a way of accommodating um, Ukrainians that, that uh, let's say the Irish don't accommodate other groups in that same way, but part of it is comes out of this political structure uh, of the EU and the buy-in of individual uh, countries to be part of the EU. In the Venezuelan situation, you have Colombia 
taking in so many Venezuelans. But if we go back five decades, um, so many Colombians were taken in by Venezuela. So it's it's not the fear that Rachel, I know, has been talking about, which is real. Um, there's less fear in that context because historically, uh, when uh, Colombians were being pushed out by the drug cartels, they found respite and life in Venezuela and in Venezuela and um, sort of embraced them. So they're not that different, maybe in that context, there's maybe a little bit less fear. Um, so it's it's not, you know, it's structural on a variety of different domains, right? Um, uh, but uh, the political regime issues and the historical legacies um, also play out here. Thanks for that. I, I hope that answered to an extent to uh, uh, another question we had from uh, Sharon Cheryl, which which I can't go to now. I just want to go, uh, but thank you, Sharon, for that for that question. But I, I hope Catherine's uh, has answered it to an extent. Um, Josh uh, Chandler says, "Do you believe in holding asylum seekers whilst their claims are being process processed? If so, where should asylum seekers?" be able to work whilst their claims are being processed? Should asylum seekers be held in hotels, barges, et cetera, if we do not have space in detention centers? Mike's puffing and panting there, Mike. I can please. also speak to this too, because my research, uh, previous research was please. on- Okay, you start please, yeah. Rachel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, asylum seekers should never be held and should be allowed. This this will make them sick in addition to violating their human rights. Um, and so, if if we if 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 we don't want asylum seekers to become a burden, we need to we need to give them the same. We need to give them rights. They need to be able to live in the, in the community. They need to be able to go to work. They need to have uh, their own religious communities and integrate in their local communities um, and go to school, etc. Kids need to have a life. So, my previous work was on. Um, immigration detention of children. And we did a study in Canada. And I'm familiar with the international research, um, as well as my colleagues, very large study. Um, it is just so clear that putting people in detention makes them sick. Um, we're also now doing work in uh, asylum seekers are now being held in hotels in Canada, um, which we are pleased the government is not leaving people on the streets, but often these settings uh, become um, settings where people aren't permitted to integrate. Uh, for example, in Canada, many of the children, at least in Quebec, are not able to go to school for months and months and months, which impedes their, their integration. So there's no reason um, legally mental health wise from a health public health perspective um or from a human rights perspective that people would not be able to live in the community while they're waiting for an asylum claim to be adjudicated my yeah. very quickly because we've got to close now but... yes if i can translate the puffing and panting into words um what i would say is that um basically uh, again looking at the uk we find that over 62 percent of asylum seekers are waiting more than six months for a decision on their position. Uh, some are waiting for years, actually. And we have cases, I note the reference to barges. We have reference of the Bibby Stockholm, you know, in Dorset, which holds 500 men. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, you know, very difficult environment because not only are there suicide attempts but there are also, you know, Legionella bacteria, which have caused major problems. This is a new initiative. This follows a housing some of the asylum seekers in army barracks, uh, disused army barracks and so on. And the asylum seekers in this position, and this is again the con contrast with the way Ukrainians are treated, you know, in the current, the current position, they, they, they are actually not just in this poor accommodation, but they can't draw on welfare benefits, they're not allowed to work and they're, they're just thoroughly disadvantaged in these situations. And there is a, you know, essentially um, 
uh, a way in which we can we can look at the need for a greater level playing field for people who are asylum seekers across across the piece. And so I really um, I pray for this situation. If I can I can say that with Barnabas with us as well. But I think I think that we really do need um, some radical change, and we need to treat everyone with due respect as a refugee and be very sensitive to some of the terrible consequences that they're facing in terms of schooling, in terms of poverty, in terms of other issues, particularly in the position where they're waiting for long periods for their asylum claims to be heard. Thanks, Mike, for that. One last final word from Barnaby and Catherine. Have you got anything to add to that? I think it's a lovely, pertinent way to uh, to close. Um, so thank you very much, very much. Sandy, do you want to uh, say anything? Sure. Thank you, Mike. Um, this has just been a wonderful discussion, and it does give some hope in difficult and tense times that people can reach beyond the immediate day-to-day -day issue and try to talk about this from a humanitarian and, and uh, uh, perspective of kindness and dignity and humanity. I just think it's it's terribly important, uh, sometimes hard to see those solutions and those perspectives when, as Catherine and others point out, there's such tension on this issue from, from day to day. So thank you all. Uh, this is exactly what I would say Mike and I had in mind, a good way to open our new year of, of discussions. And uh, we'll have 11 more this year and be up to 50 by the end of the year, I think. So uh, this is this is a model. Thanks, of course, to uh, to Mike and and his wife Maggie for all that they do to keep this series going and uh, and inspire inspirational. Thanks to our colleagues at Georgetown University. Jack DeJoy, the president, is very supportive of this, and Tom Banchoff, our international dean, and and uh, really we've kept this going with the. Uh, the moral support of quite a few people at Georgetown and at Oxford, for that matter. So uh, thank you all for becoming part of this recent tradition. We're going to get everybody together one of these days who's ever participated in these conversations and have a, quite a hoot nanny about the good that can be done. I don't know if the government's really allow us to do that, uh, Sandy, but let's see. Um, <laughs> we will try. Um, yeah, my my thanks to uh, Michael Sachs, Barnaby Aspey, Catherine Donato, and Rachel Connick. Thank thank the four of you very much, and and of course to uh, to Sandy for chairing the panel. The next free speech project at the Crossroads International Dialogues event, uh, in association with the Future Humanities Project, will be on Wednesday, the fourteenth of February, at eleven a.m. EST, four p.m. GMT, when we're going to try to discuss the impact of worldwide elections in 2024, when nearly half the world will be electing their respective governments. What's going to happen? What's it going to be like? What's the scenario going to be? So we're going to have a look at that. Um, I also want to mention that uh, another Zoom on uh, Monday the 29th of January, when uh, Dr. Mob Myola from uh, Loyola University in the US will be discussing Macbeth in our Cultural Encounter Encounters Books That Have Made a Difference series. And that'll be at 11 a.m. EST and 4 p.m. GMT. And I hope you uh, you can tune into that on, the, on that date. So I uh, hope so. Uh, my thanks also to the people at Blackfriars, John O'Connor, the Regent, Richard Finn, the director of the Lascaux Institute. And also my thanks, and uh, I know Sandy's also to uh, John McCabe and, and other colleagues at Georgetown who have made this Zoom event happen. Thanks everyone who asked some really great questions today. Thank you all very much. Sorry, I couldn't ask all of them, but we tried to cover all, all of the areas. And so thank you all for attending today. Um, I'm Michael Scott, I'm fellow and senior dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me now on Facebook as Michael Kerr Scott, or on LinkedIn as Professor Michael Scott. But for some reason, I'm no longer on X. Until next time, take care, keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.